All right, in this video, I want to get into the oral word versus the written word, or what some people would call the oral tradition versus the written tradition. I've been talking to some Catholics about the Word of God, and they want to say the written and the oral are equal. And they'll quote something from Paul talking about follow not only what you heard from us that is spoken, but also what is written. And, you know, I have no problem with that. But the issue is, how do we know what was said? So let's let's give an example here. <clears throat> Since we're using Paul, let's say we both listen to Paul. And on a certain subject, I heard Paul say no. But you heard him say yes. Whether one of us is lying or we just misheard him. Okay, maybe one of us misheard him. So let, there's no ill intention. Okay, so let's not put like blaming people for being liars and manipulators. Let's just say we misheard him. One of us did, right? So we go to court and we're trying to prove this. And I'm, I tell the court, I heard Paul say no. And you tell the court, I heard Paul say yes. So who are they going to agree with? Let's say we're the only ones left that are alive that heard what Paul said there. How do they establish which one of us is right? I'm giving you a second to think about that. You see, it would be the one with tangible evidence. And that would be what is written down. Because how could you prove you right and me wrong or me right and you wrong? How could you prove it? It would have to be with what actually is written down by Paul about that subject. So if we go and we look at what Paul wrote down and he actually said, yes, I would be wrong and you would be right. And it would be proven there by what is written or the opposite. He said, no. So I was proven right and you were proven wrong. So we would correct our mistake. And that's that. And so it shows that what is written is the standard. It's the foundation. And if anything contradicts what is written, it's wrong. <clears throat> you see, what is actually orally spoken can easily be misheard. It can be forgotten. It changed and twisted by either, you know, just manipulating what you heard into your own interpretation and using your own words for it. You can add to it and remove from it. Right. I mean, it's easily changed and no one could really prove it because let's say me and you were the only ones that were listening to Paul talk and I died or you died. You know, whatever scenario you want to go through. It, but you were saying Paul said yes. I'm saying Paul said no. So if I died and I was right, you would be you went out, you're preaching a lie and no one would know. Or vice versa. You died. And you had the truth that he said yes, and I'm going around preaching he said no, and I'm preaching a lie, but there's no one else to counter me because you died. So just that simple, that easy, something like that could actually happen. But when it's written, <clears throat> well, then you have a foundation. you got evidence. You can be like, no, it's written here, clear. And there's many copies. I say, yeah, this is what he said. So this is uh, the standard. This is what he said. And uh, so, yeah, that is that. So that uh, basically adds to what I was saying about the Bible being the word of God in another video and establishing that that is the standard. I, it should be blatantly obvious, but for some reason, Catholics, Orthodox, and even other churches, uh, even the Jews, they want to add their oral tradition that's passed down and not written in to add it to the Bible, to basically say that it's equal. Even though a lot of the things you can see for yourself plainly contradict. <clears throat> and uh, I suppose I should give an example. There's teachings in the Catholic Church, and they go to the early church fathers and whatnot. Talking about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Mary being a perpetual virgin. 
and how she's all blessed and whatnot. And I've talked about this in other videos. But then when we read something like Matthew chapter 1, I think it's verse 25, it's the last verse in the chapter. It says that Joseph knew Mary, consummated the marriage with Mary, had sexual relations with Mary after she gave birth to Jesus. Because if they didn't consummate the marriage, they were never really married. And that's what married couples do. They engage in sexual intercourse. There's nothing wrong or sinful about that. So she's no longer a virgin. We can also read later on in the Gospels that Jesus has brothers and sisters. As uh, it names four of his brothers, it's like Simon, Joseph. Uh, I think there's actually a Judas or a Judah. I don't remember the third, uh, fourth one. And then it says he has some sisters, and it doesn't name his sisters. So it's showing that, you know, Mary had other children. And yes, she was a virgin when she conceived Jesus and gave birth to Jesus. But after that, she consummated the marriage with her husband and was no longer a virgin, even if you don't believe she had other children. So what do you go by? Do you go by what the early church father said and what the church is saying? Or do you go with what the written word of God says? The answer should be simple and obvious. It's the written word of God. Hence, it's the word of God. I mean, it, it has to be the standard. If anything goes against that, contradicts it, twists it, adds to it, removes from it, it's it's wrong. So that's just a, a quick example there of how things get twisted through oral tradition according to what's written. So then... If we went to court and we were to prove this, it would have been easy to be proven that the Catholic doctrine is wrong. It's that simple, that easy. Because the standard is what is written. It's the word of God. So then, with that being said, and with the Catholic Church even compiling the Bible, you know, that's what they like to say. And they say that it's the inspired word of God. Hey, why not treat it like such? Why not treat it like it actually is the word of God? So anyway, thanks for watching and take care.